Hello and welcome back to another episode of DC to Daylight. In this theory-based episode, we're going to cover the fundamentals of this semiconductor diode. We'll quickly go over the evolution of the diode, we'll discuss briefly the physics of what makes a diode tick, and of course we'll show visually different diode characteristics on our poor man's curve tracer, which just makes things a lot easier to understand. Before we get into it, I would like to encourage you to continue the discussion over at the Element 14 community. The link to that is down in the description. The advantage of doing so is that we can exchange information like videos, pictures, schematics, etc. Um, of which, of course, we cannot do that down in the comments. Comments are still appreciated, of course. Okay, all that being said, let's jump right into diodes. In short, a diode is a two-terminal device that allows current, i.e. electrons, to ideally flow in one direction and not the other. On the face, this sounds simplistic and limiting, but there are a wide variety of diodes and many useful applications that would be impossible without the diode as a building block. The operation of the thermionic diode was initially discovered by British physicist Frederick Guthrie in 1873. He noticed that a positively charged electroscope could be discharged by bringing a heated electrode in close proximity. However, a negatively charged scope did not discharge. Credit was later given to Thomas Edison's assistant, William Joseph Hamm, who in testing out various incandescent light bulbs, inserted a plate to the evacuated bulb in order to measure the current flow. Cool as it was, there was no real application at the time. It wasn't until about 20 years later, John Ambrose Fleming developed the first production thermionic diode, which was used as a detector in early radios. Here I have the closest analog I could find, an old rectifier tube from the 1930s. It has a tungsten filament, which when I put a few volts through it, heats up, boils off electrons, which can travel over to the plate, in only one direction, not the other way around. I would take some proper measurements, but uh, it takes over 20 amps to keep this thing running and my variac is on the verge of melting down and I've already melted two sets of uh, probes on this, so we're going to skip that for now. In parallel with all that thermionic stuff, work was being done to refine the point contact semiconductor diode, initially developed by Carl Ferdinand Brown in 1874. Later the lead sulfide crystal Galena would be more plentiful and much cheaper for crystal radio use. Here I have an example of a Galena diode. This little wire is not actually a cat's whisker, but a spring that one would have to poke around on the surface of the crystal until you made good contact and your radio worked. Before we jump into the typical PN junction explanation of a diode, it helps if we understand the difference between conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. If we look at a simplified atomic model of an insulator, there exists a valence orbit or shell where electrons are buzzing around the atom. There also exists a conduction band way out here. Now if we impart some energy to this electron, we can try to push it into a higher orbit where it can migrate to an adjacent atom. Okay, this area is called a conduction band. For an insulator, it takes a very large amount of energy to cause this to happen. For this reason, insulators behave the way we expect them to. They are the rubber coating on wires, the protective gloves we use, ceramic and glass used in high voltage electronics, so we don't become conductors ourselves. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, take a copper atom for example, the valence and conduction bands overlap. So in its natural state, without external excitation, copper will freely conduct. Now the third case is our semiconductor material. On its own, it has a moderate what is called band gap, and will conduct somewhat poorly. Essentially, it's a high value resistor. So how can we improve and control the conductivity of our silicon substrate? If we want to increase the current carrying capability, we can add in different elements with a surplus or deficiency of electrons in their valence orbit. This process is called doping and it's done with very expensive equipment that can either chemically diffuse these elements into the silicon or through ion implantation. That, that's kind of getting off topic. When these silicon crystals are grown, they're usually formed in a furnace and extruded as a large ingot. The atoms are tightly packed together and form a crystal lattice. Neighboring atoms lock arms and share their valence electrons in a covalent bond. Each atom shares eight electrons in total in their valence orbit with their neighbors. There exist two possible types of doped materials, N-type, which has a surplus of electrons, and P-type, which has a deficiency of electrons. N-type semiconductors are doped with a pentavalent element, penta meaning having five valence electrons. So there is a single free electron that can drift throughout the crystal lattice. Typical elements used in the doping for N-type materials are phosphorus, arsenic, or antimony. If we want these free electrons to move or conduct, we need to give them a place to travel to. This is called a hole. We can dope intrinsic silicon with a trivalent element having three valence electrons with boron, aluminum, or gallium. So now instead of four outer electrons, we have three leaving a hole. Now any free nearby electrons will want to pop into that hole and subsequently leave a hole behind. This is known as recombination and represents current flow. Let's look at what's going on with the electrons within the PN junction. 
I'm gonna keep things a little more palatable and not get into ions and minority and majority carriers. We'll simplify things into explaining in terms of free electrons and holes. We know that we have a p-doped material with an electron deficiency, so we say that there are holes in the valence of some of these impurities. We'll denote them as a positive charge. Just note atoms do not move. Electrons are in charge of moving and creating the current flow. On the other side, we have an n-doped material with an excess of electrons. So p-type, there are periodic holes, and n-type, free electrons. Something interesting happens when we put these two materials together. Because of thermal agitation, these electrons are wiggling about, and they notice there are holes next to them at the junction where they meet. These electrons fill the holes within the p-material and leave holes behind in the n-material. This process continues until a space charge is developed at the junction and an equilibrium is reached. Note that this all occurs without any external voltage applied to the substrate. This area is called the depletion region and sets up a barrier potential, which must be overcome if we want to forward bias the diode. For silicon, this is 0.7 volts, and for germanium, it's about 0.3 volts. So if we apply an external voltage to our diode with the positive terminal attached to the P region and the negative terminal attached to the N region, electrons at the right side of the N region repel free electrons, and they are forced toward the PN junction. Where the positive terminal of the battery is in contact with the P region at the left, holes are forced toward the PN junction. This causes the depletion region to reduce and electrons will drift from the N to P region, while holes will drift from the P region to the N region, causing current flow. This is forward biasing the diode. If we flip the polarity of the external voltage source, the opposite conditions occur. Holes are attracted to the negative terminal of the battery and electrons are attracted to the positive terminal of the battery. Also interesting to note, this condition causes the depletion region to increase. This all causes the diode to act like a very high value resistor and current flow is severely restricted. This is the reverse bias condition. In dealing with semiconductor devices, it's useful to graph their characteristics and is commonly done with current and voltage. This is typically graphed out on a device's VI curve. This is the typical curve for a small signal diode. Current is along the Y axis and voltage is along the X axis. Now if we forward bias the diode and start from zero volts while increasing as we approach about 700 millivolts, the diode begins to conduct heavily. There is also a slight slope to the line which represents a resistance. Basically the steeper the line, the lower the resistance. If we reverse bias the diode, of course it acts like a high value resistor so the slope is nearly horizontal. Though there is some leakage current, as you can see the line dips slightly below the X axis. The sharp vertical drop off at the left of the curve is the reverse breakdown voltage and it's a good idea to stay away from this voltage as you could release the magic smoke. Now let's take a quick look at a few different types of diodes on my DIY curve tracer here. Uh, this will allow us to plot the diodes VI curve on the oscilloscope. So this I call my poor man's curve tracer. So it's just really a variable um, supply for a train set and it's got these four terminals over here that uh, supply a fixed voltage. It's about nine volts. Now with our oscilloscope in XY mode, we can feed it the X and Y signals for the vertical and horizontal uh, deflection to the scope. So the X uh, channel is measuring the voltage across these two binding posts, all right? So we've connected our diode here that we're gonna measure. And on the Y channel, it's measuring the voltage across this 91 ohm resistor. Now I am fresh out of half watt uh, 100 ohm resistor, so I just threw in a 91 ohm resistor here. So for this guy will represent any current that's developed across this circuit and represent it as a voltage on our Y channel. Okay. So let's go over to the oscilloscope and see what this diode looks like. Okay. So our oscilloscope is in XY mode. We have X on the top, we have Y on the bottom, and we can see here along the X axis is the voltage across the device and along the Y axis is the current flowing through the device. Let me explain something about the curve tracer real quick and this will make a little bit more sense. If I take this diode out of circuit, okay, and that represents an open, so we have an infinite resistance, okay, so it's a flat line. If I short out those terminals, that's what a short circuit looks like, okay? We have a vertical slope. So it probably makes more sense now if we look at this, uh, if we're at zero volts and we're pushing more positive voltage across the device, trying to forward bias it at 0.2 volts, it's not on 0.4 volts, it's not on. And at 0.6 volts, okay, we start to see it sh it's basically a short circuit, right? It's almost straight up and down, but there is a slight slope to it that indicates that it is a resistance. And we can figure out what that bulk resistance is, okay, using Ohm's law. So we know that resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So we can take the delta between the voltage at two points and the current um, between two points, uh, divide those two and then we can figure out you know, that slope. So we're not gonna do that today, it's a little outside of the scope of this video. 
Now I want to try something a little different. I've got this selenium diode here, which is uh, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it's old school technology and it drops a little bit more than 0.7 volts across uh, the junction. There are actually multiple junctions from what I understand in this thing. <laughs> Check that out. So obviously this guy conducts a little later. So I looked up uh, a data sheet on this thing. I couldn't find one for the exact part number, but it, these things drop anywhere from like five to eight, 10 volts. With one volt per division, uh, this selenium diode, one, two, three, about three and a half volts is where it starts to conduct. And you can see the slope of that line is not really vertical like our small signal diode was. It's got pretty much, it's got a pretty good slope to it. So not the best diode in the world. You can see why they were replaced with silicon diodes. So we also want to show you what the input waveform and output waveform look like if we try to pass a sine wave through a diode. Like we said, uh, current only flows in one direction. So during a positive cycle of a sine wave, we should allow the current to flow through the device. And during the negative cycle of the sine wave, we should cut it off, right? So we're basically chopping off the bottom half of the sine wave. So that's basically what a diode does in a linear or even a switch mode power supply, right? Diodes only allow current to flow in one direction. So we're getting the DC component of an AC waveform, even though it is a pulsed DC output. And we'll see what that looks like. So I'm feeding in about uh, three volts peak to peak on the input here, and that's about 100 hertz. I'm monitoring on channel one of my oscilloscope, the uh, sine wave that's feeding into the diode. And on channel two, we're just monitoring the output. So let's see what that looks like. Here's our function generator, 100 hertz, three volts peak to peak. Let's turn this on, okay. And here's what our waveforms look like. Our yellow sine wave is channel one. So that's our input voltage at three volts peak to peak. We're at 500 millivolts per division. And you can see the output waveform is this blue uh, trace. So we're basically cutting this guy off. And then you notice that the output waveform is slightly lower than the input waveform in amplitude. And that's because of the barrier potential, right? We are losing 600 millivolts. But this is what happens in a linear power supply, right? We take some voltage in, maybe it's 12 volts from the secondary of our transformer. We feed that through a diode. In this case, a half wave rectifier because it's only one diode. We can do a full wave or a bridge rectifier, right? Um, and that would double our frequency, but keeping things simple here. Um, and uh, that's what it does. It chops off the bottom half. And if we wanted to, right, like any good linear power supply, we add a capacitor to the breadboard. So I'll just add a capacitor, make sure I have the polarity right, or else it will release the magic smoke between the output of the diode and my reference ground. Well, I put this wire here for that purpose. And would you look at that? We have the input sine wave, and then we have this nice stable DC voltage that's been filtered out. So I'm gonna pull that capacitor out and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So that's without the capacitor and that's with the capacitor. So the capacitor is basically charging up on the positive going cycle of that sine wave. And then uh, as it reaches the peak, it starts to discharge and it charges up again in the next cycle, so on and so forth. Um, so if I put a load on the output of this, it would drag that down. For linear power supplies, as load increases, you generally have to increase the capacitance. But this is just a good basic demonstration of how a rectifier works. Well, that is it for this episode on the humble little diode. I hope that I've shed some light on the subject of the PN junction and that the visualization on the curve tracer was useful. I know for me, seeing things actually working and not in the pages of a textbook is helpful for me to burn things into my mind. Uh, maybe it's the same for you. If you did find this useful, let me know down in the comments. Uh, this really was a cursory introduction to the diode and there are many other considerations to take into account, like bulk resistance, frequency response, so on and so forth. I would love to continue this discussion over in the community. At least there we can share pictures, videos, and the like, and uh, we have a better chance for interaction. So the link is down in the description. I look forward to hearing from you, and that's it for me. Have a good one.